Good. So welcome. Um, this is the third meeting we're doing for this group about knowledge graph embeddings for knowledge graphs that we're generating in Corona Y and other biological knowledge graphs. So uh, last week we did our second round. We did the hello world of knowledge graph embeddings using the PyKeen software library. And we saw some very fast success using kind of its high level user interface, which is called the pipeline. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time talking last week and I challenged you guys all to try what we had done together and to make some permutations to try changing the loss functions, to try changing the number of epochs in training or to investigate some of the other things that were documented that you could change around uh, or, or the model, for example. Um, so maybe some of you got a chance to, to try that yourself. The other extra double challenge was to try using the hyperparameter optimization pipeline, which I didn't show an example of. So that would have required a little bit of documentation reading. But, um, you know, this is a work in progress, what's been documented and what hasn't. And I've made some updates to it as we've been going. And then, of course, the thing that we're really interested in is how to take our knowledge graphs that we have already and, and apply these methods to them instead of just using the benchmarking sets. So we made a couple updates um, to to this algorithm that was creating splits between knowledge graphs for training and testing sets. And, and Max, who's joined us this week, he's part of the PyKeen project, part of the core team. He's the master of metrics, as I've, I've called him, but he's also really good with PyTorch and probably the best guy at implementing the models on, on the, the team. So, so it's good to have him here. He's going to explain a little bit about the metrics before we start, but, uh, and, and then he's going to get going because he's a busy guy with lots of other meetings. Um, after that, I, I hope that we'll let you guys all talk and then I'll listen and try and provide some feedback. Um, maybe some of you have something that you've done already you want to show us or uh, we can try, yeah, maybe we can try doing some live coding and, and training some biological knowledge graphs with some of the new updates we made. So yeah, um, Max, I know yeah. I kind of put you on the spot by messaging you like a half hour <laughs> ago, but I really appreciate you joining us. Um, so you can explain something about the, the hits at K metrics, the, the MRR, the mean reciprocal rank, and the normal mean rank. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your special ranking that's better than all of those called the average mean rank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as already said, it's a bit on short notice, so I haven't prepared like the beautiful slide set uh, yet. <laughs> um, okay. Maybe um, uh, shall I square, share my screen? Yep. Oh, Are you I, able to do that? Should I change the settings? Not yet. <laughs> okay. All right, you should be able to do it. Okay. Yeah, now it works. Give me a second. Okay, so now you should see some paper, right? So I just um yeah, I just wanted to, to use this for uh, this example knowledge graph because I know there was an example in this. Um so maybe just quickly recap what a knowledge graph is. Um you can think of it like um or it is a multi-relational graph. So we have um, nodes and edges between them and these edges are typed more or less. So you have, um, for instance, this character in edge. So you know this edge is of type character in. And you can also represent um, this knowledge graph in form of triples. So for, uh, head relation tail, like a Spock character in, in, in Star Trek. And um, to come to the task of link prediction, there we aim at um, predicting missing links mainly. And now the thing is that we don't, um, if we want to apply machine learning, we need some labels like um, for positive and negative examples to somehow um, train a decision boundary or something. And in knowledge graph, we typically don't have explicit negative knowledge. So for instance, if we have like uh, Alec Guinness and Star Trek, we don't know whether he hasn't played in uh, or we just don't know that he has played in, in Star Trek. Um, and this is a problem because like if we um, or this is different from classification because this is also affects the evaluation. So if we have a, like a test set where you want to um, test, like to evaluate our models on how good they are, um, we don't have explicit negative examples and we have the same problems. So um, therefore we cannot easily just use something like accuracy where you say, okay, um, of all the negative ones, you predicted 90% correctly as negative because there's this intrinsic problem of not having negatives. Uh, we can trust. And therefore, you normally formulate this um, as a ranking problem. So similar to in a recommender setting. So you um, know that some of the entities are relevant. Like, uh, let's assume again, Alec Guinness start in, then uh, Star Wars would be relevant. 
and Star Trek we don't know. And so now what we aim at is that our model should um, first say Star Wars and then Star Trek, because for Star Wars we know for sure that this is true. Um, Okay, and this is like this task is not um, only in link prediction the case, but as I said, so for instance, in recommender settings, you have the same problem. Like if you want to recommend some movies um, and we have some user interaction data, we also have the problem that if we have a missing link, so some user hasn't seen a movie, we don't know whether this is because he's not aware that there is this movie or whether he disliked the movie and therefore didn't watch it. Um, okay, and now coming to this metrics. So as I said, we formulate this as a ranking problem. And in our evaluation setting, we um, compute scores for all possible choices. So let's again assume we are uh, Alec Guinness and start in. We would compute scores for Star Wars, for Star Trek, also for science fiction, and so on. And this would give us some, uh, some scalar value. And we can interpret this value as uh, some form of um, not directly likelihood because it's not normalized, but the higher the value is, the more relevant this item is, this entity is. Um, okay, and um, when we have this, and we have a true hit, let's say Star Wars, we can compute the rank of this true hit in this, this list. So we sort all the possible choices uh, by their score, that the highest score is on the top of the list, and then we just scan it one by one and see, for instance, at position two, there is Star Wars, so Star Wars would be at rank two. Um, you can think of it again as maybe in a form of recommender setting, like you Google something, and then in the first 10 hits you should see on the first page, it would be nice to have the relevant item. Um, maybe this, and this is already the explanation for the first metric, so um, hits at K means um, if you make it in the top 10 or in the top K, then this is called like it's a hit, and otherwise it's no hit. And um, if you have now multiple of these um, queries you issue, so Alec Guinness start in, but also uh, Alec Guinness plate, you get uh, scores for each of them, like ranks for each of them. And now we can think of how to aggregate them. And um, again, um, the sits at K would just count um, how many times did you make it into the top 10. Um, okay, so far for hits at K, maybe I'm a bit fast. Yeah, so Max, when, when you calculate the hits at K, it's, it's for all of the possible triples that exist in the evaluation set. Mm -hmm. So the evaluation protocol for link prediction usually does um, both side link prediction, which means mm -hmm. that, um, let's say we have again Alec Guinness, then uh, or we have a triple Alec Guinness start in Star Wars. Um, and now at evaluation time, we would do Alec Guinness start in and compute all the possible choices for um, the tail. Um, this is like the um, actually right side prediction, just it's written vice versa here. Um, and but we would also um, ask who start in Star Wars. So this would be um, like the somewhat inverse query or reverse query. And for both of them, we um, get one rank value, and we can also repeat this for all triples we have in our test data. So we get uh, lots of different ranks, and then we aggregate them in a form. And one of them is like this hits at K, where we just compute like the fraction of times we made it into the top 10 or top K. Question. Okay, maybe, um, yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, okay, so um, in the top K, you will end up having triplets with different tails then. Like you'll have Alex Guinness start in Star Wars, Alex Guinness start in Star Trek. And mm -hmm. if Alex Guinness start in Star Wars is within the top like 10 or whatever, then we call it a hit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understood it correctly then. Thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe uh, regarding the questions uh, of multiple hits. So um, actually this is also a good question because in a link prediction setting, we might have the case that we have many true hits. So for instance, if we have like uh, some actor, he does not only star in a single movie, but in many of them. And um, therefore, um, let's assume that we have Star Wars and uh, another movie where he also started, let's say, another Star Wars movie. Um, and then we shouldn't like punish the model if he predicts uh, the first movie higher or the second movie higher because both of them are true, like are hits. And um, therefore what we can do to get rid of this is called the filtered setting. And in that, when we consider this triple um, at a Guinness start in Star Wars, we would uh, compute all the scores 
then we would uh, throw out everything from which we know that that is true and then uh, accept this one choice and then we would uh, proceed as before so compute uh, whether the uh, uh, star wars is now in the, the top 10 again and now the effect is that if there are other true triples because they're not part of the list anymore they cannot like um, decrease the rank because ranking another valid choice higher than the actual choice should not be punished. Yeah, and, so and we, since this was introduced, this has been the standard, I think. That's correct, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we like, um, like if we have Alice going to start in Star Wars 1 and Alice going to start in Star Wars 2, then mm -hmm. we like kind of just arbitrarily choose Star Wars 1 to be the one that we calculate the hits K over? Uh, we would do it for all of them, but when we say Star Wars, uh, currently we're looking at Star Wars 1, we would um, throw out the Star Wars 2 of the list. So we would like only um, punish the model with a higher rank if he scores other things from which we don't know that they are true higher. Okay, gotcha. And when you and say Star Wars 1, you mean episode 4, correct? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, so far for, for uh, hits at, at K, maybe um, we should have maybe started with the mean rank because it's even simpler. So mean rank means just mean over all the ranks. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, very simple. Um, like one downside is uh, that you more or less inherit all the downside of the mean. So um, it's sensitive towards outliers, which means that if your model like messes up one of the triples, and let's say it predicts like uh, the reverse order or something, then you get like a rank of number of possible choices. And if you have a huge knowledge graph, this is a huge number. And of course, this will uh, strongly affect your mean. Um, okay, but this is like a general problem of the, of the mean. Um, like maybe one measure which was used to um, get rid of this is this mean reciprocal rank. And the idea is instead of computing the mean over the ranks, we first compute the reciprocal ranks and then compute the mean, which means like uh, position one is, is a one, then uh, position two is a half, uh, a third, and so on. And you can see that this quickly decreases. So the, um, you cannot really distinguish between, let's say, uh, one divided by 100 and one divided by 1,000. So there's a small difference only. Um, and this has the effect more or less that um, we uh, focus on like the, fir the first, let's say 10 again, but this is like a smooth version of it. So um, getting into top one is really valuable. Getting into top two is also valuable, but it, this uh, strongly decreases with increasing the rank. Um, this has also some downsides because um, for instance, um, the, uh, like in, in this reciprocal rank metric, uh, improving from rank two to rank one is as worthy as improving from rank infinite to rank two. So you're um, like, you do not see really improvement in these, um, these higher ranks. And this particular may be um, interesting when um, you train your model initially and then you don't see any improvement because it's not reflected in this metric because it's really looking at the first uh, parts. Um, okay, and then this, for instance, in the early stages, maybe it's more interesting to look at, at to the mean rank because there you can see the improvement at, at any position. Okay, maybe, um, yeah, so uh, one quick word about this uh, adjusted mean rank. Um, the adjusted mean rank, um, on the one hand, can be seen as a very simple extension where you, instead of looking at the absolute rank, look at the relative rank. So you say I'm not in the top, uh, like at rank uh, 10, but at rank 10%. Uh, and the benefit of that is that um, now you don't need to consider the size of the data set anymore in order to um, interpret the mean rank. Because otherwise, let's say mean rank of 10, if you don't know how large your data set is, you cannot say if this is good or not. So on a data set of size 10, this is very bad. But maybe on a data set of, uh, with millions of entities, this is a really good result. So, um, sorry again, another question. <laughs> um, so uh, the the mean though is over over what? <laughs> um, okay, this is uh, you have your test data set, and this contains some some triples, a number of them, 
And for each of them, you do the left side and the right side prediction. And each of these predictions gives you one rank. And so you have uh, a number of ranks. And over those, you aggregate some measurement. So in that case, it would be the mean over all these individual ranks. Ah, uh, OK, gotcha. Thanks. OK, yeah, maybe one nice property about this uh, adjusted mean rank is also that um, because of the normalization um, constants and uh, the mean rank being the mean, um, this is actually equivalent to comparing the mean rank you get with the performance of uh, a model which would just predict random scores for every triple. So the expected mean rank of, uh, sorry, the adjusted mean rank of this random model in the expectation would be one. And so smaller values are better, similar to, to mean rank. The smaller, the better. And you can more or less directly compare against this random baseline. And if you have uh, just a mean rank close to, to one, then you know that you are doing as good as random prediction. That would be kind of okay. sad. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, OK, maybe I could also talk uh, briefly about this different rank uh, variants. Maybe since they're also in Viking, uh, I do it quickly. Um, okay, so I talked about the rank and I said that this is the index in the sorted list. Um, this is a very like natural choice, but it doesn't say us or tell us anything about what happens if we have equal scores. And depending on the model, um, it is possible that many choices are received equal scores. For instance, if we have a dot product with something, and uh, like, let's say I applied ReLU beforehand, then we have zero entries in the, the vectors. And if they um, happen to uh, be like at least one zero entry in each of them, uh, the components, we get like uh, many triples with zero score. And in particular, like it's not only that they get very small score, but they get exactly the same score. And so this definition of just saying, okay, this is the index in the sort list doesn't uh, really specify what happens now. And um, since this seems too trivial, it hasn't really <laughs> been considered in the literature for quite some time. And therefore, there are like different variants what to do there, because normally you don't think about that this can actually happen. And so you can more or less categorize them into, um, I think we call them like optimistic, um, realistic, pessimistic rank. So in the optimistic ranking setting, you would say, um, I'm like the best among equals. So um, if I sort my list, then all of the, the parts that have an equal score, then, uh, then the currently considered entity are scored below this. And this is like an upper bound of what you can reach for any order. Uh, similar for um, a pessimistic or worst setting, there you like get the lowest rank among those with equal score. And um, for the realistic, you just average those two. And this is also the nice property that this is again the, um, the expectation over all possible orderings which respect your score, like your sort order. Okay, and so, um, maybe as, as a practical consideration, when you look at um, the metrics for different, let's say optimistic and uh, pessimistic setting or a best and worst setting, you can use this to see uh, whether your model does actually produce um, similar or exactly the same scores for many triples. So if they deviate uh, uh, a lot, like if the, the best rank is much better than the worst rank, then you know that this can only happen because you have uh, many triples where you predict exactly equal scores for um, many entities. And so what do you think in practice is the best one to report if they're all pretty close? Uh, for those different rank variants, you mean? Yeah, for, for pessimistic, optimistic, and average. Yeah, I think the average like gives you um, the most reliable measurement because uh, it doesn't depend on uh, like yeah, as it is like the uh, expectation of all possible rankings which um, like respect your sort order. But st still, you should um, maybe also take a look at this best and and worst since it can gives you give you hints whether you actually have a problem in. Um, having many equal scores. Yeah. Because and, like in practice, it doesn't help you, right? So if a model just says every choice has a score of zero, then uh, I'm not sure like what is now the, the answer to it. I cannot really sort by that. 
or it's rather arbitrary what the, the sort of node tells me. Yeah, and the good news is PyKeens, well, it's good and it's bad. PyKeens reporting all of these different variants. So when you get this metric mm -hmm. object at the end, you get like maybe 15 different scores at this point. So this mm -hmm. is a little bit, um, a little bit uh, overwhelming maybe for new users, but that was a really, really good explanation. Thank you, Max. Does anyone have any questions? Anybody uh, who, who showed up late? We have a recording of this. Of course, this will go up for YouTube later. I just want to say thanks. Like that's a really nice explanation and really helpful. Happy to hear that. <laughs> As I said, so if I would have uh, had some time, I maybe prepared better. But <laughs> glad to hear that it uh, still worked. <laughs> Great. If nobody has any questions, then we have to release Max because he has other things to get to. And then, oh, oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a quick question, if, if it's okay. Uh, actually, I just wanted to ask um, about um, how this is, say, uh, you know, is applicable to biological uh, networks. So I was just thinking, like, uh, in your suppose you had character played by this. Mm -hmm. So uh, suppose I had um, on 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 one side we can have like similar relations. Like suppose I would say a, a gene is. Uh, uh, I want to know, uh, uh, suppose these are cancers, uh, like different cancers, and they are both fall uh, under cancers like Star Wars and Star Trek, uh, mm -hmm. say pancreatic cancer and liver cancer. And then a gene is involved in each, and a gene of uh, phosphorylates, uh, sorry, a protein phosphorylates another protein, you know, and, and that, mm -hmm. that protein is, is causative for it in both cancers. So I was just thinking, um, like uh, in a practical application, so that way. But on the other hand, like we often look at like gene upregulation and downregulation. So there's a kind of a direction to it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so like for a corona, why like we are trying to build this knowledge graph, uh, you know, from the from the data set, and then we want to infer these relations. So, um, it, like, do you have any suggestions, like what kind of networks and what kind of metrics would be helpful for our knowledge graph? Just just a thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, um, maybe uh, in general, I think the framing it as a link prediction problem is quite important here again, because having it just as a simple classification would again assume that you have like knowledge about all the interactions. So if you don't know about an interaction between several components, then you would assume, okay, this is, there is no interaction. But actually, I think there is, it is very similar, uh, like this um, knowledge graph link prediction setting. If you don't have an edge between some components, you just don't know whether there is an interaction normally. So you don't have the full uh, combination of all possible entities. Um, as for the, the task now, um, uh, so generally, I think from application side, often the, the hits at K is more or less what you're looking for. Because uh, this is, if you think about like a, let's say, search engine, so you want to know what are the 10 most likely courses for that, then you somehow you have to limit your, your results. You cannot show the full list. So uh, like um, maybe the user who's, who's browsing this would look at, let's say the top 10 um, entries, and this would be exactly reflected by, uh, by this um, hits at K metric. So this means more or less you truncate at, at K entries. Um, if you want to have a more smooth version, then maybe um, something like, like mean rank is, is better suited. So mean rank you can interpret as, um, again, as in how long do I have to scroll um, down this list on average until I find true hits. Okay. Yeah, okay. Maybe best to just uh, first try out with the knowledge graph and see like these different ranks. Uh, do you have any examples like uh, uh, like a GitHub or, or any papers also if you can post like this paper that you were showing? Um, if you can, uh, Charlie, maybe you can also post it. Yeah, well, let me let me find you all these examples. Maybe did, you can check out the last two weeks recordings where we did some specific examples. And today let's do a biological example together. Yeah, no, no, I've, I've been watching, yeah. uh, I've, I went through the last two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank so you. Mm -hmm. we have to let Max go though. Yeah. Okay. Max, yeah. Him <laughs> All right. All bye right, Max. then uh, have fun. Bye bye. <laughs> so, okay, now everybody maybe has a little bit better of a feel for the metrics that we're going to use to evaluate the graphs. Um, and. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is a really good point that you brought up that how we apply these to the biological graphs that we have versus these, you know, kind of toy graphs that are built into PyKeen. Um, get, getting this intuition for how they can be used in real knowledge graphs or like 
ones that we care about, because of course these aren't real knowledge graphs. Uh, yeah, we'll do that together. So do you kind, do you kind of get the idea now, Sidmitra, or, or, or you're on mute still? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, have, I have some idea, but I have to try it out really more. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that's, yeah. So, so then I open up the floor. Who got a chance to try out running some of the code that we talked about last week? Sorry. So I, I um I tried I, I I followed along and I did the um uh the example that you worked on in last week's call um I tried the from Emma just now I, I ran into a little snag there I guess but I might be able to patch that but I also tried head I headio net mm -hmm. um and just basically cloning the workflow for nations using HedioNet, and uh, I got another kind of error. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. HedioNet, um, so, so there's, there's kind of a difference between some of the mm -hmm. uh, data sets that are built into PyKey, and the mm -hmm. computer scientists don't really like to think about real networks. Like I've, I've bashed computer scientists before, and so one of the things that we have for all of the training, for, for most of the training, uh, most of the test, no, what's the word? Most of the um, benchmark data sets have already been pre-stratified into a training set, a testing set, and then a small validation set. So um, when we have real networks, especially biological ones, we have to split them up ourselves. And you know, we're always running into the issue that the stuff that we split, we don't get to train with all of it, which means that our model might miss some important stuff, but you know, we live in this kind of world where we don't know a lot of negative knowledge. So it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to know which parts are important for training and testing, but you know, this is actually a problem with all of machine learning and with generalizability. So, um, and which is, yeah, not the, the lack of negative edges isn't the cause of this problem, but it does make it a little bit worse. So with HedioNet, this is one of the ones that's built in using this data set mm, harness. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't used it so much yet. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're running into, it's probably just because we haven't tested it enough. I see. I just got a bug, like an index error, index out of range. Oh, it's it's the same it's the same problem with the Indra stuff that I've been kind of working on this split cleaner, because when you split a data set up, it's by chance likely going to be the case. It's already split. HedioNet is already split. No, it's not. It. Uh, I mean, if you do hedionet dot summarize, it shows you training, testing, and validation, and the number of triples in each one. Yeah, yeah, it's we're we're doing we're generating the splits ourselves, and so the issue with the splits that we generate ourselves is that uh, if you just randomly take a network and you cut it up into some parts based on it being maybe an eighty, ten percent, ten percent split, sometimes mm -hmm. it's the case that there are entities like certain genes that don't show up in the training set that do show up in the testing set. When that happens, you get this index error because it's going to try and do an evaluation and say, hey, there's no embedding for that node. We didn't calculate one during training because we never saw it during training. Mm -hmm. so, so the pull request that I think it's number 21 on the repository that I've been going back and forth with Max on that I've, I've uh, sent the notebook example that actually is inside that pull request. Um, has sort of a solution for this split problem where it, it solves this issue and it kind of does some shuffling around after uh, the splits have been made to make sure that every entity appears in the training set. So if I run off your, if I buy a clone uh, and run off your pull request, should it work? Or do I, I does this still require me to then explicitly split the data in a separate step or? Um, I think the way it's set up now is that the split function automatically does this cleanup for you. So mm -hmm. in theory, I think it should work uh, for the HedioNet data set as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, did we, did we learn anything besides that? Um, I know we wanted to start with these easy small data sets before moving up to the big ones because, but besides, you know, code not working, uh, we're going to run into other issues like, oh, I started training it on Monday and it's Thursday and it still isn't done yet. Sorry, I can tell you next week. 
because you know when you get to these big data sets, it's going to start taking a lot longer to, to train. And if you're not using a GPU, it may be infeasible even on your, your local machine. So can I put someone on the spot? Is, Wendy, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Do, do you mind uh, showing what you've done? Or have you got a Jupyter Notebook maybe that you wouldn't mind showing us? Um, I don't really have a Jupyter Notebook because I got a dot, like a simple script that I was trying to run and um, kind of, it's more or less like what you demoed last week. I just, but I just tried a few different models. Um, and as I was talking to you, kind of like I found a bug in the rotate model, uh, which is now being fixed um, where um, it wasn't running on the GPU. Um, but otherwise I kind of didn't really do a lot more than that. I mean, I tried, so kind of in your example, you um, tried to kind of, uh, I think it was predicting the tail or the relation and I kind of didn't quite figure out how like in one of the benchmark data sets how you know what nodes there are. I think I might have missed it in the documentation. I think because like if you're um if you create a data set yourself then you know like what columns or 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 kind of like what types of um graphs there like entities there are, but I'm not quite sure how to extract that from the benchmark data sets. Yeah, um, so, so one of the things in that notebook was that word cloud, which sort of gives you a little bit of insight into what kind of stuff is in the data set. Um, yeah, I think we talked a little bit about how you can look at the actual list of all the triples, and then there's a couple operations you can do on a set of triples to get the Python set of all of the strings for all of the entities and other relationships. Um, but that's that's good. So you, you tried training on, on one of the benchmark data sets, like the nation's data set? Uh, the kinships. Kinships. Okay. Um, can you just tell us which one performed the best? Uh, well, I you. don't remember. I didn't, I don't know, I just uh, tinkered around. I didn't really try to measure anything. Okay. <laughs> good. Um, did anybody else try something and have some some experiences? Did anyone find bugs? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tried <laughs> to run a Hello World notebook mm -hmm. locally, and I failed to run. I uh, got a lot of uh, errors. Oh. Uh, yeah. I started with. Uh, with uh, GitHub version, and then I tried to install from uh, pip, mm -hmm. from pip version. Uh, but yeah, then I tried to use uh, Google Colab uh, notebook, and it works uh, better. Almost every row. Uh, Uh, run, but but not all. Uh, for example, uh, I got warning warnings with uh, model world cloud. Yeah, Could yeah, that one import model world cloud. Yeah, that that uh, box. Unfortunately, the the package that's used to generate those word clouds isn't on PyPI, so. I don't remember if I wrote it into the Hello World notebook. You actually have to install it like by using a GitHub link. Uh, yeah. The problem, and, and we uh, we made some updates to the documentation to remind people of that on the README. But yeah, sorry about that. It's a little confusing. But hopefully, um, besides that, you should have been able to run all the core functionality and. Yeah, maybe you also, if you hadn't installed uh, matplotlib, then you would have had a problem with plotting the losses. Uh, yeah, core functionality, it, it works. Yeah, it works in Google Cloud. Good. Um, I, I tried in Google to, when we were looking into the rotate issue, uh, to use the GPU. Are, are the Google 
co-op notebooks GPU enabled or is it not? Yeah, sure? yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay, I'm gonna have to figure that one out because uh, I wasn't able to do it. You should, uh, you should just be able to click change runtime type. But oh, sometimes okay. they maybe have. You can, maybe you guys can show me because I, I've never used the Google Colab before. I mean, it's very similar to Jupyter Notebooks, but there's some other stuff going on, some extra commands, right? I can share the screen, sure. Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it is very similar to uh, regular notebook, and it works. Yeah, except, except, except uh, work cloud model. Oh. Try signing with pipe install. Does that not work? work? Yeah, but it doesn't <laughs> because count year out of existing styles. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe we need to switch that from using SSH to just using HTTPS because if you don't have credentials, it might get upset. So if you change it to HTTPS, and then you get rid of that Git at that comes after the slash slash before GitHub.com. This is still, still isn't going to work. You have to delete the git at. Oh, it did work. Wild. Okay. Magic. Yeah, Magic. wonderful. <laughs> uh, so finally, finally, I just. Can, can, you, the note. can you scroll back up to the Some part words. where you train the model, please? We run the pipeline function. So, so you said that we can enable the GPU here. Can you try changing the device from CPU to GPU? Let's see if that works or not. No, it says no CUDA devices were available. Uh, I think. You need to change the runtime. All right. Um, Alex, if you go to runtime at the top. Like underneath the hello world dot IPYMB title, like next to tools. Uh, next to runtime, next to it, that. Ah, mm -hmm. And then click. Uh, Try change, change runtime type, right? Yes. Uh, GPU. You have to restart it though. Mm hmm. Uh, you have to run it from the beginning again. Uh, yeah. Like restart the kernel. Again. Oh, okay. We got to hit install a bunch of stuff. <laughs> um, is is the Colab hosted at all by Corona Wise architecture, or this is completely Google? Uh, this is completely Google. Okay. I was conflating those things with our internal. Uh, there is an another error, Twitter. but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think just just keep that, going. That's just a more a warning thing. Yeah, I don't even know who's using Chainer. Okay. Maybe it's it's starting up CUDA. Okay. Expected device CPU, but got device type CUDA. Oh, Wendy, is this the same error you got? Yes, I think because you're installing is the newest version on PIP. Yep, we haven't uh, we haven't pushed the the bug fix to PyPI yet. All right. <laughs> We got close, but <laughs> unless, you want to, unless you want to redo this whole thing, so we can we can change it and try try doing uh, the installation from from the GitHub um, branch. But I don't know if you guys want to like watch that. Should we try it? Yeah, let's let's try. 
Okay, so go all the way back up to the top with that pip install. And uh, no, just leave, just leave the GPU on. Don't change it. Keep the GPU on. Yeah, we just need to change the... Do you want to change uh, we, We're going to change what we pip install. We're going to change it to, rather than be PyKey, and it's going to be this. Git plus HTTPS. So, so I just put it in the, the chat on, on Zoom. It should be Git plus mm -hmm. HTTPS and then the repository. So, so the master branch, we've, we've already uh, merged the bug fix. So hopefully this uh, means that um, we're not going to have this problem. Oh, did we merge the bug fix? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Um, I ran it from the master branch. OK, but before you do that, you have to turn the GPU back on. There's talk run time or? Run time. Change type. Okay, we're good. Uh, but you still need to restart anyway. Oh. Yeah, because once uh, once you've imported something, it, it saves it into a dictionary called sys.modules, and you have to kind of do some tricky stuff to get rid of stuff that's already been imported and overwrite it. I think... Oh, okay, just... successful, successful. Build. Major. All right, it's working. Look it's how much faster. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, so for everybody who's like a little confused why there was an error right there, it's not that there's errors everywhere in PyKeen. Well, there are, but you know, like. Get, get <laughs> um, the, the rotate model is special. It has um, it represents complex numbers, and so there's a little bit of some trickery going on within the uh, definition of the model and we forgot to move one of the tensors from the CPU to the GPU. So that's, that's why that all was going on. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you debug that, like when you realized that you forgot to move the tensor to the GPU? Um, the error message that it gave was saying uh, this, um, so if you're training on GPU, it was saying, sorry, this tensor is on the wrong device. And so then we looked at, you know, where was that tensor used within the code? And then we found, oh, look, we forgot to move it from the device to the, from, from well, then they get created, they get created on the CPU, and then they get moved to the GPU. And one of the things that PyKeen is taking care of is, is shuttling data back and forth between the memory inside the GPU and the CPU, because some operations doesn't make sense to store everything on the GPU. Actually, the GPU has limited memory even, so you don't want to just have everything there. When you're done with it, you bring it back to the CPU. What kinds of things do you store on the CPU? Well, basically, when you're not doing calculations or optimizing or, or calculating gradients, you, you want to move everything back to the CPU. And, and that gets taken care of for you. you. You don't have to do any of that stuff if you're just using the top-level interface of PyKeen. And besides this hopefully isolated error, we won't run into this issue again. Fingers crossed. Thumbs tucked. Yeah, this is another runtime error. Oh, well, this, this is, you know, because I implemented this code and I can't be trusted to write PyTorch. Huh. Expected object of device type could have but got device type CPU. Yep. All right. So this wow. is like exactly what you mean? Yeah, this, this is okay. the kind of error that we had before. Gotcha. And, and, you know, when it came to the rotate problem, I said, uh, you know, hey, Max and Lauren, what's going on here? Can we fix it? And they said, oh, yeah, that's specific for rotate. And then, you know, we don't have any really good unit tests for this predict tails, predict heads thing, because I implemented that. Like, we keep telling everybody I'm definitely the, the least qualified person to be creating a machine learning library of the PyKeen team. <laughs> so, so if we change uh, the model, it should work, right? Um, yeah, but that last part is still going to have an error. So better put an issue on GitHub for that. 
Thank you. I think I can share this notebook. Okay. Good. So um, besides doing a little bit of debugging and troubleshooting, because we're working on some kind of new code that hasn't been tested so much, um, what do you guys think we, we should be working towards next? Everyone, uh, are you feeling like you still need some time to get used to using this library? Or do you want to have some more realistic use cases because training the kinship data set is like super boring? What's everyone feeling right now? It would be nice to know how to put some, like your own data or real life data sets into it rather than the benchmark ones. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely what everyone wants to see. Um, yeah, and, and so I was working with, well, I, I kind of put together a, a pipeline that takes Indra statements and puts those directly in for, for training. We had a little bit of issues with the splitting problem that we talked about about a half hour ago. Um, but that's kind of working together. And then, yeah, I think I need to put some examples so you can be confident and put your own data sets in to do some training. Um, so I have to put a little bit of that together. I didn't prepare that for today. Uh, but I could show you doing the training on the, the intergraph if you guys want to see that as kind of a yeah, yeah sure. palette taster. Can you remind me what the Indra graph is? Um, so yeah, sorry, there's lots of different uh, pieces of biological information in Indra. And uh, one of the examples that I've been using over and over is the, um, the RAS model, because it's kind of small, it's good for examples. Um, and then of course, we kind of want to use the COVID-19 graph that gets put together on a daily basis. Um, you know, the Indra systems have got a lot of different parts to it. Uh, one of the most interesting things is they put it uh, they've set up basically a cron job that I don't know if it's on a daily or a weekly basis, but it's pulling in all of the new literature and it's doing the, you know, the reading process. So named entity. Uh, daily. daily. Yeah, that's pretty baller. I mean, no one's ever put together something like that before. So on any given day, we can pull the latest um, graph that has all of the information from Cord 19 that has been pre-extracted from Indra. And then we can, we can train a new machine learning model on it. Uh, How are then, they doing that? Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, we are uh, pulling down uh, the daily updates from Core 19. We're also running a search every day for papers and index in PubMed uh, that have COVID-19 uh, as a search term. And then we run uh, six different text mining systems on all that new content. And we add those edges into this model that we host on a, on a website called Emma. Um, if you go to Emma, E M M A A, so there's two A's, uh, dot Indra dot bio. And then, uh, so we actually use Charlie's library PyBell as a way of assembling some of our networks and doing looking for toggle paths. And then, um, Charlie has also, um, uh, implemented a nifty feature so that you can give the name of a model on Emma and just say PyBell dot from Emma, and then you can get it in the form of a PyBell graph automatically which is pretty useful. So I can, I can show you guys. I think my screen should be sharing right now. Um, I'll send the link to this notebook again. I think it's already in our Slack channel, but, but this is an example of us doing exactly that. We can import some of our PyKeen stuff. Um, and then down here, I'm also importing PyBell and I'm using PyBell to get this RAS machine graph from Emma. And there's a lot of, <laughs> A lot of stuff living behind the simple little function and, and maybe two solid years of work between me and John and Ben and, and some of their team. So, so it's really nice that this is uh, able to be put there. And now I've changed the function around. So it's called two triples. So, so it's a little bit easier looking. So I put this all in kind of a, an if statement. So you don't have to run this PyBell stuff every time and you can just get to using the triples that you want. So, so as this uh, looks, there's this RAS machine triples file and this is what's inside it. It's got some, some looks like a chemical right here, and it's activity negatively, directly negatively regulates the activity of this gene, and there's some other kinds of relationships. But a lot of the stuff coming out of intra is this kind of negatively regulates activity of, which, you know, more colloquially, people call inhibits. Um, so yeah, that's the- I've never seen this 
rendering of Bell into this triples-like form. Yeah, this is kind of some, some weird mixture of Bell and not Bell. Um, it, it's, it's not good for, for when you have um, protein versus RNA versus chemical um, differences. You have to capture those differences within different kinds of edges. So anyway, this is, this is the one way you could output Bell as triples uh, that are you know, really simple triples. And then, you know, once you've got a set of triples in a TSV file that's three columns, uh, there's this factory uh, function. So you, you do from pykeen.triples import triples factory. I'm just writing this one again. It's at the top of the file. Um, and the triples factory is pretty good at, um, at it giving you an interface to load up the, the content that you have. So if it's already as a NumPy array, uh, then you can just give it uh, as the triples. If you have the file path, you can also do uh, path equals RAS triples path, and then it takes care of, of loading up those triples yourself. Um, there's all sorts of other magic that happens inside this path thing. You can, you can also do something really wild. You can, uh, you can say like index, and then you can give a UUID for an index network, and then it downloads it, and then it turns it into some triples. You can, you can give it a, all sorts of different kinds of files. You can give it a bell file, like my Sylventa stuff dot bell, and then it knows how to load up bell files and then automatically process it. Um, we could probably add an Emma like thing, so it could be like Emma RAS machine. It basically parses and it looks if there's like a prefix with a colon, and then it you know has some different ways of deciding what you should do based on what the prefix is. So so there's a lot of different ways to get content in, but you're probably going to have something like my triples.tsv. Um, and, and then you have your triples factory. So this takes care of loading it into the NumPy array and mapping it because you have to use uh, indexes that are integers instead of strings when doing this kind of machine learning stuff. But this takes care of all that for you. Then the next line is this split. So you, you have your triples, but you need to make sure that it's split into a testing and a training set. So you can use a split function. And in the notebook, I give it a random state just so it splits the same way every time. And uh, once you have a training and a testing factory, rather than giving the pipeline the name of your data set, you can actually say, here's my training triples factory, here's my testing triples factory. And, and from there, everything's actually the same as before. Uh, you can do all the same stuff. Only caveat being, if you want to use the early stopper, you also need a, a validation factory, which means you would have to do this. You would have to say validation, and then you would have to give it what are the percentages for your split. Yeah, and if you decide you don't want, uh, but by default, I think it's a point, uh, point 0.8 to point 0.2 split. If you want to change it to some other you know, ratios, this is where you put them. So I'll, I'll give another like very simple example that doesn't have all the fancy bell or Indra stuff, maybe just like a triples file that you guys can take a look at and then try and start doing this yourself. So that's our hour. Uh, I think we learned a lot this week, especially from Max. I mean, he, he's explaining that really well as before it's, it's very complicated to figure out all of these metrics and now uh, you have the ability to start training on some networks that you actually care about. So for, for next week, I hope you guys can take a look. When you, when you find errors, like please let me know, like message me on Slack or just put an issue on GitHub and then we will make the fixes as fast as possible and then try and push it to PyPI so then it's a little easier to install everything. Um, yeah, and then maybe next week, with, with more motivation to train on your own networks, you guys can show something that you've done. Let's, let's say it would be nice if everybody creates a Jupyter notebook to show next week. Is that fair? Like if you've got time, that'd be really great. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, any uh, parting uh, thoughts, uh, uh, questions? Is there a way to, it's a very random question, but is there a way to disable the, like the, the pretty progress bar thing on Jupyter Notebooks? Because for whatever reason, my TQDM isn't 
has a really weird install and it doesn't seem to want to run on, in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, even yeah. after all the widgets and stuff. I'm pretty sure the pipeline has a use TQDM equals false. I think that you can do that and then it won't show that oh, okay. first bar. Cool. Because for, there are some settings where you just don't want the TQDM stuff because it makes a huge mess. Um, and if you don't like this, this kind of pink logging, you can also use the Python logging module where you import logging and then you do logging dot get logger and then you say pykey and, and then you can set level logging dot warning. Yeah, you can turn some of that stuff off as well. Okay, cool. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. Okay. Charlie. Well, that's it, guys. Everyone, thanks for joining. Thanks for sharing some of your experiences. Thanks for, um, you know, bearing with us as we, we fix a couple bugs. You guys get to be uh, on the cutting edge with this. So you should be proud. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thanks. much, Charlie. All right, so same time next week. Uh, we'll see you then. We'll talk to you soon. Same time next. See you then. Bye. Bye.